Hey everyone, God bless you. Thanks a lot for tuning in. My reflection today I've entitled Godparents, and I'd like to uh, expound a little bit upon the ancient and universal custom of the church, the unbroken tradition in the Christian faith of having godparents or sponsors when someone is baptized or received into the church. Uh, this is not something that's new. It's not something that's made up. It's as something as old as the church itself. We're just approaching the beginning of Great and Holy Lent. And so this subject of receiving converts, of course, is uh, high on the minds of all priests. And uh, especially in these days, uh, there are so many seeking uh, the church and finding uh, roots and wanting to plant themselves in the house of God. I thank God for this. I just came back from a clergy seminar out here on the West Coast and was able to see so many priests uh, and deacons. And I heard from so many of them uh, the beautiful reality of how many people are visitors and how many are in their parishes are moving from being visitors to being serious inquirers and then catechumens in preparation for holy baptism. I've experienced this also here at uh, my parish of St. Andrew. We've had a, a serious catechism program for many years, uh, over 20 years, and we've consistently seen that catechumen population grow. But over these last few years, it has just uh, skyrocketed. Uh, at the present moment, we have 80, that would be eight zero uh, catechumens, which is a real shock, and it's also uh, become a, a great challenge to properly prepare them. And godparents are absolutely key. Can you imagine with me um, what we're facing for those 80 to be received into the church? Uh, we need to find godparents or sponsors for them. That will require, since a candidate needs at least one sponsor of the same sex, that will require at least 80 individuals to stand with them. If they also take a godparent of the opposite sex so that they have a godfather and a godmother, that's another 80. That's 160, uh, <laughs> most of whom no doubt will be from uh, our own parish to, to do that. Imagine if the numbers are quite larger. For instance, St. John Chrysostom, when he was patriarch of Constantinople, in the last year that he was patriarch before he was sent into exile in 404, he was preparing for baptism. Uh, at, on Great and Holy Saturday, just before Pascha, for 3,000, for 3,000, of course, they'll each need sponsors. So just to process uh, the servant of, service of the reception of converts with that many, it's another Pentecost, and you have the 3,000 who are being received, you have at least 3,000 sponsors, it's really something. What exactly is this custom, this sacred tradition, uh, this holy practice of godparenthood in the church? It is, I'm saying, as old as the church itself. It's ancient and universal. There is no such thing as doing baptisms without a sponsor. And we have many witnesses to it in the early church. Uh, if you read the apostolic traditions, let me just read a portion for you. This is uh, apostolic tradition section 15. And let the candidates for baptism be examined about the reason why they have come forward to the faith. And those who bring them shall bear witness for them whether they are able to hear the word. Let their life and manner of living be inquired of. So here you have it. This is a very early witness. We also have uh, testimony from St. Dionysius the Areopagite, which I'll read to you in a minute. Uh, St. John Chrysostom in his very famous text, uh, Baptismal Instructions. These are his lectures to catechumens. Uh, in that text... I'll read to you. It's in the second instruction, paragraph uh, 15 and 16. He, in the middle of his instruction, addresses the sponsors. And note that the sponsors are there receiving catechism. Uh, they're going through the catechetical process next to those that they're sponsoring so that they can reaffirm what they're hearing and help uh, their um, godchildren get it and make progress. And listen to what Chrysostom says to the sponsors. Do you wish me to address a word to those who are sponsoring you? So he's talking to the catechumens, and then he asks them, do you want me to, to address your sponsors? That they too may know what recompense they deserve if they have shown great care for you, and what condemnation follows if they are careless. Consider, beloved, how those who go surety for someone in a matter of money set up for themselves a greater risk than the one who borrows the money and is liable for it. If the borrower be well disposed, he lightens the burden of his surety. 
if the dispositions of his soul be ill, he makes a ri the risk a steeper one. Wherefore, the wise man counsels us, saying, If thou be surety, think as if thou were to pay it. If then those who go surety for others in a matter of money make themselves liable for the whole sum, those who go surety for others in matters of the spirit, this is the image he's using for being a godparent, you're being surety, you're making a pledge on their behalf. Those who go surety for others in matters of the spirit and on account of which involves virtue should be much more alert. They ought to show their paternal love by encouraging, counseling, and correcting those for whom they go surety. So here he's fleshing out the job of a godparent to encourage, to counsel, and to correct their godchildren. Let them not think that what takes place is a trifling thing. It's not a small matter. But let them see clearly that they share in the credit if by their admonition they lead those entrusted to them to the path of virtue. Again, if those they sponsor become careless, the sponsors themselves will suffer great punishment. Ooh, ooh. There's a blessing uh, from God for investing in your godchildren and working hard to develop their love for God. And there's also, if you're careless, great punishment. That is why it is customary to call the sponsors spiritual fathers or spiritual mothers, that they may learn by this very action how great an affection they must show to those they sponsor in the matter of spiritual instruction. It's a family bond. It's a father in the spirit or a mother in the spirit. And that should inspire the love and devotion between godparent and godchild. If it is a noble thing to lead to zeal for, uh, to a zeal for virtue those who are in no way related to us, much more should we fulfill this precept in the case of the one whom we receive as a spiritual son in baptism. You, the sponsors, have learned that no slight danger hangs over your heads if you are remiss. Being a godparent is a very, very serious business, and the church has always practiced it. What's the purpose? What exactly do godparents do? Well, you've heard it. They, they stand as surety or as sponsors or as recommenders. They vouch for those that are coming to baptism. They vouch to the priest that these people are prepared, that they know the creed, that they have sought purification and have conformed their lives to the commandments of the church, and that these people are prepared for holy baptism. They mean business. Their pledge to Christ is authentic. Uh, and... If you're a priest that has just a couple people who are going to be received, then it's reasonable that you yourself can do this kind of examination. You can find out about their work and about their reputation, and you can watch and watch over them. If you're St. John Chrysostom and you're going to receive 3,000 people uh, at Holy, on Holy Saturday before Pascha, this is what he did in 404, if that's the case, well, that would be simply impossible. And even in, in my case this year, I have so many catechumens, I have 80 catechumens this year, I simply can't know if they're ready. I can know if they've attended the classes. I can know if they've fulfilled the, the protocols for preparation, but I'm very dependent upon the sponsors to know about their lives. So this is one of the most important functions of sponsoring people. Another is to function as a guide and a teacher, as a true father or mother in the spirit, in the church, an ecclesial parent. St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, writes this. He says, The parents, according to the flesh, must entrust the child to a baptized Christian who is a good teacher in spiritual things, since the child will be under that person's direction for his entire life as a spiritual father, since the child will be under, or, or as a spiritual father, and a guarantor of that person's life in God. This is St. Dionysius' word about how important it is to choose the right kind of godparent because that person functions in a pedagogical way as, a, as an encourager, as a counselor, as a corrector uh, for the whole life. In fact, godparenthood and the bond that is formed in holy baptism between the person sponsoring the candidate and the candidate is a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a, it's a part of the many miracles that take place in holy baptism. In fact, in the sacrament of baptism, a bond is formed, what's called by the church a spiritual bond, is formed between the sponsor and the godchild 
that is real and in fact is more substantial than the bond of biology and blood. We see this, uh, the contemporary elder Cleopa of Romania, elder Cleopa of Romania in his teachings on godparents calls out uh, the 53rd canon of the Sixth Ecumenical Council as a witness to this miracle that takes place. Let me just read uh, from the councils here in Trollo, the 53rd canon of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Canon 53, it's entitled that the sponsors of children, the godparents of children, are not to enter into marriage with the widowed mothers of their godchildren. The fact that the church regulates um, levels of intimacy between godparents and godchildren and families involved, in this case, the godparent and the widowed mother of the sponsoree, shows that there is an intimate bond that is formed in baptism that would make that an inappropriate, a spiritually incestuous connection. This is why the church forbids such marriages. Listen to the text. Whereas spiritual kinship, becoming family by the spirit, is better than bodily union, and we have learned that in some places men who have sponsored children in holy and salutary baptism have later entered into marriages with the widowed mothers of these children, we decree that henceforth this should not be done. If after the present canon any persons are found doing this, they shall be in the first instance desist from this unlawful marriage and thereupon shall be subject to the penalties for those who have committed fornication. So here you have it. The miracle that takes place is a miracle of the establishment of a family relationship, of a true bond in the spirit. So when you obtain a godfather or a godmother, that person is is family for the rest of your life. Uh, they come to Christmas dinner or are invited to Thanksgiving. That's just how it is. Uh, it's simply uh, a miracle, an absolutely a miracle. It entails, of course, living that way, right? Godparents and godchildren pray for each other every day. Godparents stay in, ta- in contact. They find out uh, and, ke- and recognize important days like a, their godchild's name day or birthday. Uh, they're, they're tight. It's, it's a relationship that exists in reality by the spirit that needs to be nourished and developed. Who should be one? Exactly who should be one? Well, you heard the Council of St. Dionysius. Uh, Elder Cleopa offers uh, some even more detail. He says, Godparents should be chosen from among the most serious and pious of Orthodox Christians, regardless of what their social standing may be. The godparents are the spiritual guides for the godchildren and have a greater responsibility than the biological parents. A godparent... uh, I should read that sentence again. The godparents are the spiritual guides for the godchildren and have a greater responsibility than the biological parents. A godparent must be a moderate person of good moral character, gentle, a good example in the society in which one dwells. The godparent should know the orthodox faith well, be faithful to the creed, knowledgeable of the catechism and holy scripture, and should attend church regularly. That is why it is not permitted to have godparents at a baptism or sponsors at a wedding who are of another faith or who are not married in the church, nor those who are sexually immoral, who refuse to bear children in marriage, are drunkards, divorced, or have a bad reputation. A great deal of care must be used in choosing godparents, and the choice must be discussed with your parish priest, since it is before him that they will vow to care for and instruct the godchildren in the fear of God, promising to watch over them, to bring them to church, to be sure that they confess their sins, and to strive in virtuous deeds. The godparents are to visit regularly the godchildren in their home, admonishing the child when necessary and giving them orthodox books to read, as the guarantor of the child before both God and man. Wow, what a beautiful word. This is what we should look for in godparents, in sponsors. Not our cousin, not our brother or sister. Uh, this, This unfortunate tradition that exists in many places in orthodoxy that we simply grab a relative to stand as a sponsor uh, is lamented by by many. Father Alexander Schmemann in his book uh, of Water and the Spirit, his reflections on baptism, spends a a lengthy footnote lamenting uh, this practice of family members, biological family members functioning as godparents. We already have that beautiful bond of biology and family. 
Uh, and in baptism, we should choose someone based upon their virtue, not on their uh, physical or biological closeness to us. We want to find a, a sponsor, an anadecomenos, an anadecomenos, a person who's going to actually stand as surety for us. We want to find someone who is virtuous and who is a model Christian to, to be with our kids. Before I close, let me just ponder with you one more thing. What happens if you have a bad godparent? What if you have uh, uh, your godfather or godmother has forgotten you or you've just grown apart and you don't have any contact with them? Can you replace them? I've actually been asked this many, many times over the course of my pastorate. And the answer is absolutely not. If you have a father, a biological father, who is a drunk, well, I'm sorry, you have a drunk for a father. Uh, you should pray for him. You should help him. You should mourn, very natural to mourn in such cases, but you certainly don't replace him. Now, you may find a spiritual father who can give you great encouragement. You may find friends who can fill that gap, uh, but you're always going to be uh, connected to your father. It's exactly the same with a godparent. If you have a godparent who is uh, a failure, well, then you have a failure of a godparent. Uh, you can find other people to, to encourage you or encourage your children if the failure of a godparent is a godparent for your child, but you can't replace him any more than you can replace a biological parent. What else? I guess the real question should all be, though, not just what happens with the, when the godfather or the godmother fails, but what about us? What if it's not they who stink, but we who stink? What if the godchild stinks? The godparent, of course, doesn't give up on them either. This is a relationship forever. I want to end by uh, an encouragement that also comes from Father Alexander Schmemann in his text on Water and the Spirit, where he, he says that, uh, in all times throughout the history of the church, perhaps today in the West, we need a vigorous commitment to God parenthood. In this time when, when Christian culture is collapsing, we need God parents who are serious more than ever before. And he makes all sorts of very practical suggestions on how parishes can really invigorate the process of catechism and by nourishing a culture of responsible godparenthood that will serve uh, the church in the long run and help many people to um, hold together and remain faithful unto the end. Godparents, we have to find our godchildren and stay close to them. And may God be pleased with us uh, as we live the life of the church and especially practice this ancient and universal custom of godparenthood. God be with you. Now available at patristicnectar.org. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present Theological Foundations God, Man, and the World in Genesis 1 through 3, a 10 lecture series. The opening chapters of the Holy Bible provide the fundamental elements of the Christian worldview. There we learn about the one true God, the human being fashioned in God's image, and God's meaning-infused creation. These texts, which have always formed a central element in the Church's catechetical ministry, present the most important of Christian convictions. These chapters are particularly relevant today, as secularism has suppressed these essential truths from the Western mind, and priests can no longer assume that these basic theological affirmations are believed by those coming to the Church or raised in the church. These lectures are presented as an aid in the formation of catechumens and as an effort to set forth the transcendent beauty of the glory of God, of the human being, and of God's magnificent world. For these and other available titles, visit our website at patristicnectar.org.